Hello, Matthew. We've got Matthew and Llewellyn. Am I saying that right? Pretty good. Yep. Okay. Uh, Graham Bray, really good to see good you. Good morning. And um, Joe Mailer, Ryan Underwood. We'll get started in about seven or eight minutes so we can filibuster for, you know, seven or eight minutes. Your brother can introduce yourself to one another. We may only get 10 or 15. I don't know. Uh, we will see. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Graham's muted. It looks like he's trying to speak, but he's on mute. Okay, Llewellyn, where are you from? You're in England, right? Yep, in, in Bristol, England. Bristol, okay. I was at one of your downtown big churches, I forget the name of it, where um, William Penn was baptized. Mm. I forget the yes. name of the church. Uh, it wasn't the cathedral, but his father was an admiral. Um, Mary's Redcliffe, possibly? Or, yes. Yes. Yes, we had an organ recital there that we hmm. uh, went to. And the admirals buried in the southern apse with, yes. uh, with a memorial to him. Of course, William Penn himself became a Quaker. Hmm. Uh, whereas his father undoubtedly was Church of England. Yeah. So, uh, Michael Justice, Joe Mailer, good to see you, brother. How you doing? And Ryan and Graham Ray from Greetings, up at, up north. And I'm I'm just I'm sorry I was a little bit late. Um, uh, my nephew was having trouble getting connected. I hope he can get in here. I see Cameron Leslie. I think from Scotland, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, Hello. I'm sorry I was muted. I did uh, acknowledge your greeting. Thanks, Donald, and greetings to you guys. Lord bless our time together. Yes. We'll be recording this, and I'm going to voice activate so I can get like a literal transcript of our meeting. I hope that works. Uh, give me a second. Just fiddling here with... There we go. Uh, who else do we have? We got Graham, Lou Allen, Church of England, and then uh, somebody by Hicken now. There was a man from Philippines who wanted to join us too. It's 11 p.m. in the Philippines. So we'll get started here in four minutes. I should have sent a preliminary agenda list but i didn't so uh the imperfections of a beginning i'm calling this a synod or a fellowship an association and affiliation cody justice where are you from hey greetings uh brethren yeah i'm from west virginia um, I think I saw you, Donald, post about this last week or briefly before there. I don't recognize the others except for, I think, Matthew Bryan. I believe we're friends on, on Facebook. So saw it and I thought this looked interesting and wanted to see what it was all about. So glad to be here. Looking forward to what's going to take place. Um, I see Linda Reynolds is here. She won't be able to stay with us the whole time. There's some other issues percolating. 
And I'm really, it's really good to see all of you. Uh, and Graham, it's been a while since we talked. It is, yeah. And uh, Ryan and I had a wonderful trip down to Orlando, Florida, to Reformation Bible College, a Ligonier yeah, Ministry. Ligonier Ministry. I saw that on Facebook. Yeah, that was an interesting uh, visit you you had there. Yeah, and of course, a highlight was lunch, or at least at lunchtime with uh, Vesta Sproul for about an hour. Sproul, we got to see R.C.'s grave. Of course, R.C. was a yeah. was really my bishop when the R.E.C. bishop was was not my bishop, except in name only. And we'll get to cover some of these things, God willing, as we go. Um, I'm going to be start, I'm going to be starting in prayer in about two minutes. Call a meeting to order. And again, I apologize for not for not having a preliminary written agenda um, for you. Let me see why this isn't working. Maybe that will work. Uh, so we'll just have to kind of go, you know, subject by subject. Um, there's lots of things to discuss, for sure. Uh, we're reformed. We're prayer book people. Unabashedly reformed. Um and we'll want to talk about that. So one minute and we'll get going here. Wait for others to join us. And this 10 or 15 minutes is pretty good. I see Christian Bolano has joined us. Um, on, yeah. we're, again, we're going to put this on YouTube. So if you have additional items that you would like to comment on you can add it in the comments hit the like button uh that gives us a little more punch and power with youtube so that'll be for those who could not come and yet would like to follow what's going on. well it's 10 a.m and i would like to open this with prayer the lord be with you with our spirit with our spirit let us pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. from evil. For thine is the kingdom, is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever, and forever and ever. Amen. 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 Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the meeting is hereby called to order. And if I could, let me just take a couple minutes to hit some of the key points. Uh, first of all, do we need a denomination? And if so, why do we need such? Secondly, why shouldn't we just work within existing structures where we're at and grow where we're planted? Or is this just an affiliation, association, fellowship? It, I think it's certainly that because we're here as fellows brothers and then important 
in the consideration from my side is do we just consider the 39 articles or do we add other reformed articles? That's really big with me. And I'll get to that in a minute. Some may be in the ACNA. Some may be in the Church of England. Some, like Graham here, with the Free Church of England Evangelical Connection. And that's where my credentials are currently parked. FCE hyphen EC, the Americas. Although I don't have, they're, they're really some proactive South American brothers with close affiliation with those good brethren in England. Graham Ray's here this morning. Um, some of the confessions I'm talking about, and then I'll, what I'll do after I go through this two, three minute agenda, the first four ecumenical creeds, Nicaea, Constantinople 381, the 431 Council of Ephesus, and the Chalcedon Creed of 451. The 39 articles, of course, but amended so that Erastianism is not in it. Um, that is the power of parliament and the royals to call assemblies. And I would say the same for the Westminster Standards, to uh, the 1781 Westminster Confession of Standards Americanizes it and allows the church itself to call the assemblies. Heidelberg Catechism, Belgic Confession, which is kind of Second Helvetic Confession of 1562, the Glorious French Confession of 1559, the Scots Confession, 1560. I'll add that there were six Johns who signed that. One was John Knox, and the other was John Spottiswood, a Scots Episcopalian. The Lambeth Articles of 1595. Why we never embrace that in the REC, I don't never know. The 1615 Irish Articles by Archbishop James Usher. And of course, my beloved Westminster Standards. Emma Weirdo, have been a weirdo all my life, Westminster Man and Book of Common Prayer. <laughs> then I would like to add for discussion and see a part of a group, fellowship, or denomination, including the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy and the Chicago Statement on Hermeneutics. I don't really want to get into or near the 1658 Savoy uh, Declaration, which is Congregationalism. I think we should have a presbytery of the ordained and the lay people and their council. Some more issues. Um, so you can see that I'm kind of for a global Catholic reform confessionalism. So really, one of the early questions is, do we want to move forward on that? And that may take us a while to sort through that. Also, BCP reforms. I think the Reformed Episcopalians had a few good adjustments on the 1662, and I use the 1662 here every morning, except I adjust it for the royals. And, um, how often do we want to meet? Every two weeks or once a month? Uh, schools, and I know Jeff Hubbler is a big time, in fact, Jeff is here. God bless you, brother. Jeff and I are classmates. And I've known him back to the 1980s as an old REC man. And well, maybe he'll get to, I, I would like to talk about uh, setting up an online seminary. Now there was a man, Matthew Byer, uh, Byers, who apparently is a website genius who has talked about it. On the model of the North American Reformed Seminary. Very, I think it's the best seminary in the United States, bar none. Presbyterian and Reformed, but then add in liturgics and a few Anglican classics like Barrage, uh, Beverage, and a few others. So schools is a big issue. 
for graduate and undergraduate, which can be done online, but then also K through 12. And we've got Ryan Underwood, who is an online instructor with the classic mm -hmm. schools, along with Jeff Hubler. Jeff's got hundreds, literally hundreds of children who love him. They call him Dr. Hubler. And that is one of Jeff's great contributions in his area as an educator. Um, also to set up a series of issues with uh, Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy, American Anglicans, and how we would engage with them. Um, I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm not Greek Orthodox. Will we be missions-minded and an evangelism or just simply a fellowship that's kind of introverted and an echo chamber? Then the issue of ordinations, examinations, education. Uh, and I think we're going to have to talk about uh, government. Do we want the Hungarian and Usherian model? Um, with a moderator of the classes or moderator of presbytery, maybe with term limits, because a bishop is an elder. Um, that's, and I think, so what do we think of bishops? A third order? I'm not there. After having had, I've only had one good bishop in my life, and that's Bishop Theophilus Herder. And then today, the only guy I'm willing to call bishop is Bishop Malcolm. In the Church of England continuing. Uh, and then some more practical things, and I'll finish here in a minute. Do we want to say something about charismatics and that unseemly music that dumbs it down? Also, liturgical actions. I think we ought to have a statement where we uh, negate or prohibit the bowing to the cross, Bowing to the table, that happened in the Episcopal Church where I was at, or the crossing of oneself, or genuflecting, or elevating the host. And we, do we want the minister with his back to the people, ad orientum, or ad populum to the people? Women's ordination, I, I cannot support that. North side. North side, okay, Joe's, Joe's a north sider. Also, the Declaration of Principles, Graham, in the old FCE and old REC book, maybe with a few additions. And then vestments. As far as I'm concerned, uh, others may differ, but cassock, surplus, scarf, and academic hood, and not an ounce higher, inch higher. And then how do we establish fraternal relations with other Reformed groups? If so, how? And then after we're done, this is going to be about an hour, and I'll stop talking here and let you guys jump in. Um, mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? I think we're a fellowship. What do we call ourselves? Okay, the floor's open, brethren. Okay. Now, those uh, are my preliminary ideas. Okay, we can't talk about everything that you no. suggest. Not in an hour. Nope. So let's first of all talk about the establishment of churches and uh, uh creation of a denomination okay i i'm more in favor of, of the concept of having unaffiliated churches until you can find a denomination say that again joe have unaffiliated parishes until you can find a denomination or create a denomination okay. uh this way you can set it up pretty much along reformational lines confessional lines and Set it up now. I'm a, I'm a big believer in the prayer book. The prayer book has rubrics, and the rubrics are the laws of the church. It also tells you what ceremonies you can do. So lifting up that host is first of all in violation of 39 articles. Yeah. It's also uh, uh, part of the worship of the sacrament or the host and things of this nature. This is. This is all no-no, yeah. and, the, and the prayer book doesn't allow it. Prayer it says, take it in your hand. It doesn't say lift it up so they can see it. Yeah. Uh, the same thing is uh, making the sign of the cross when you, you're giving a blessing or uh, pronouncing the absolution. 
There's nowhere in the prayer book that allows it. And it all says something. And it's important that if we're going to be reformed, that we understand what's being said by our actions, not just our words. Yeah, so, Joe, I was at the Keener Lectures at Reformed Episcopal Seminary about a week or two ago. And it was an interesting lecture. But when the prayer was finished, I'd say three quarters of the room crossed themselves. I, that's not the old REC that I knew. I mean, I didn't say anything. That ended up talking to the president, to the school, and Bishop Gillen at length. It kind of singled me out, which was, I've told Ryan this, which was weirder than weird. Um, it was almost hyper sugarcoating i got uncomfortable with the gushing but then again and i should tell you and update you i am viewed as this is news to me as of yesterday according to a reliable intel source i'm viewed as a weapon of destruction against bishop shifty sutton and word is on the street and all the acna and rec bishops know me um so I don't know if they were just trying to sugarcoat, sugar it up, but it was unnatural. But anyways, I was at that, and they're all crossing themselves. I, whatever. Well, that's what happens. You got to turn right into the uh, wood, and it's going to eat it out from the inside. I'm going to tell you, brother. Two, three years ago, and I got a nice house here. Over on the western side, they, they got up under the troft and they found a whole series, wide area of termite infestation. It cost us 4000 to fix it, and we did. But termites get into the beams, and, you know, you don't see them, but they're working. Yeah. Can't hear them either. Yeah. <laughs> well, does anybody else have anything to say? Yeah. So I, I'm um, speaking from uh, our situation here in England, whereby um, our standpoint really has been from the time when uh, the um, attempt was first made to accept um, a Tractarian bishop. Um, and... Uh, in order for that bishop to be recognized by the denomination, the, there was a plot to um, remove the then primus. Uh, and that um, was done by means of um, some very spurious charges being brought against um, the then primus. <clears throat> With the result that unfortunately the, that primus, who was a godly man, and who um, took a very, he, he had a Presbyterian background, but he, but he took a very strong reformed stand. And um, we uh, stood with him. Uh, a number of our churches stood with him. But uh, the bishops at the time who were working alongside him, or the assistant bishops who were working alongside him, they... Um, ignored a decision of our convocation to drop those spurious charges against our primus and uh, not only that but they um they used a, a clause in our um, constitution the articles of our constitution to um get a certificate from a lawyer from a solicitor to exclude those churches who wouldn't recognize this um, attractarian bishop. And um, we were, were actually, referring to John Fennick? That's correct, yeah. And we, um, we were issued with a certificate on the very morning of the uh, um, 2004 convocation. And um, we, we, uh, discussed this on the, on the steps of the convocation and we said look let's go in you know this is this certificate is not um, valid it's not it is an irregular um, um, decree that's been uh, put through the uh, the, the um, 
solicitor's office that has no bearing on our uh, denomination uh, structures at all. It, was, it wasn't, um, there was no consultation with the churches that were being excluded and it wasn't um, run past a convocation at all. And we certainly weren't party to anything leading up to this um, certificate that, that excluded us. Um, and we debated this for some length of time. And finally, um, our Bishop Primus then, Arthur Bentley Taylor, he said, um, well, let's just retire then. Let's just withdraw, which I, I think was a, uh, with hindsight, it's easy to talk with hindsight, but I think with hindsight, that was a very unfortunate decision that was made at that time, because we had every right to go to that convocation and, and say our piece. But anyway, we all um, retired from that uh, convocation. Um, and uh, in the next couple of months, I don't think it was even a year, um, John Fennec had been uh, admitted into our ministry um, having been uh, dismissed really from the, uh, well, he dismissed himself from the interview because he went off um, when the question was asked, are you a three-stool man? And he sort of ummed and ahed about that, didn't give a straight answer, but just vacated the uh, the meeting, which uh, Arthur Bentley Taylor took as his, as a, him withdrawing his um, application to our, ministry um and next thing we hear that the charges have been pressed again contrary to the decision of convocation the charges were pressed against the primus he um was suspended and guess what uh, john fennick uh, was um, brought into the uh, first as a, as a as a presbyter very quickly advanced to the episcopate and very quickly advanced to advanced himself. Really, I don't think he got all that many votes. He might have done. Uh, he might have just scraped through. I don't know what the voting was, but he very quickly advanced himself, pretty much, to being the primus. So now this chap is actually control. You know, you were talking about um, well, one of, one of your points for the agenda. Be right back. Um, Go ahead, Graham. So, sorry. My cat's yes. acting up. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> your cat, sorry. Um, yeah, so just to cut a long story short, your your question was, or, you, or one of the items on your agenda was, do we want to work within the present structures or do we want to start something new? Well, ideally, in, for, for just talking from my own perspective, uh, we would like to, if you want to put it that way, um, rescue or we claim to be the free church of england as originally set up in in our 1983 con constitution and we don't see uh lord willing that is of course we, we don't see anything to be gained by allowing this takeover that has been orchestrated so cunningly and so um uh, so um heavy-handedly by the, uh, the the relative newcomers. I mean, we're talking about 20 years ago, but not, it's, it's a relative new development this since, um, uh, even since I came into the denomination. And we don't see why we should just hand over to um, to John Fennick and his, his supporters. So we're trying to get a meeting together, a neutral meeting under the, um, chairmanship the neutral pet chairmanship of gafcon or some of the representatives here in the uk of gafcon and we'd ask for your prayers really uh on that because um a lot of whether we pull out of the free church of england or not depends on being successful in, in that meeting if we can get fennec to the table and we can um call him to account it's a matter of church discipline for us, really, because Fennec has, uh, in his publications and in his um, report, uh, his uh, papers that he's pre presented over there in the States to the REC, um, attack the, the basic Declaration of Principles, which, according to our Constitution, are, are un unalterable. He can't do that. 
So it is a matter of church discipline for us. But uh, it's in the Lord's hands as to whether... Graham, Graham, can I interrupt you? Sure. Uh, the Declaration of Principles for Others is an important part of the old Reformed Episcopal Church, because there's some who don't know this. And it's a part of the old Free Church of England. And Graham and myself, Ryan, too, I believe, Oh, Joe, you also, and also Jeff Hubbler, my old friend, we are on the same sheet of music on this Declaration of Principles, but go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, are we going to, the question I'd like to ask um, the meeting is whether or not uh, there's, there's any other brethren in that same sort of um, situation where uh, you you haven't quite reached the point where you you feel that your structures have been taken over uh, without the, any possibility of any uh, restoration of the original um, shall we call it uh, founding principles of of your of your structure. It sounds like REC have gone beyond the FCE insofar as Sutton and. Uh, Razor blades. What's his name? I forget his name now. Razor uh, blades. Oh, razor blade riches. Riches. R riches. Jonathan yeah. Riches, who um, took it's... a razor blade to is his first parish in the REC at St. Philip's in Horsham, Pennsylvania, just a little north of Philadelphia. And he literally, and he would brag about it three or four times to some students that he razor bladed out of the Book of Common Prayer, the declarations of principles. Now, I also call it not just razor blades, but Dr. Cake Eater. That's a Marine term for guys who need to go on a weight program and go run four or five miles a day. Um, he has been removed at Reformed Episcopal Seminary. But back to you, Graham. And your point that we may be at a place in the REC, well, we are at a place, it's it's gone. Uh, Shifty Sutton, or you prefer me to be less Marine-like and call him Mr. Sutton rather than Shifty Sutton. I call him that not because that describes him. Um, he's all over the place in order to gain an audience. And I could tell yeah. story after story, but he endorsed endorsed two times the Anglican office book that has 250 pages out of 350 pages, 250 out of 350, invoking saints, Mary and others. And I just saw a post on Facebook last night by Lance Davis, an REC man, thanking Bishop Haverland of the ACC, Presiding Bishop Ray Sutton of the REC, and Keith Ackerman, Bishop Keith Ackerman of the ACNA. So, you know, Graham, on your point about staying in a structure um, and the FCE, back. so you go, go back, brother, and carry on. I just wanted to insert that about the REC appears to be gone. Yeah, well, th that's, I suppose, where it might um, be more, uh, let's say, practical for you guys to form a new denomination and cut your ties, really, with um, with those those people who have basically hijacked the denomination. The, the uh, concern I have about that is that... Um, it's it's that that to my mind is a um an admission that they, these guys have in fact succeeded in hijacking the denomination which is very sad but it's uh it's not the first time the lord has uh, removed a candlestick from a church so um we're in the lord's hands there and we respect your your um the position that you've reached and it may well be that uh, we we don't succeed either in disciplining the present um, leadership of the Free Church of England. They 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 have got a pretty strong 
hold on the um on the denomination uh and um haven't done so really without um a lot of opposition from us but nothing official you know we've, we've never been given the opportunity they've never given us the opportunity to actually um talk these things through uh they just dismissed us on that um uh, on, on the on the basis of that uh, solicitor's certificate, um, which was pounced on us, and we've never been given the opportunity to even um, challenge that. And it may be that we never do get the oppo uh, do get given the opportunity. So we might well find ourselves in exactly the same boat as yourselves. But uh, we haven't at least. I, I'm speaking for myself now, really, rather than the, the connection. Um, are, are we right in handing over to these guys without being given the opportunity of challenging them? Let, let me throw this out, Graham, in that direction in terms of challenging. St. Augustine said Hope had two children. One was anger. Okay, and I'll, and secondly, courage. Now, the anger, mm. according to Augustine, was to see something you didn't like and to be mad about it. Now, the Bible says a lot about anger, but see something you don't like, what you're talking about. And then secondly, now you are, you're talking about this, the fixing, wanting to fix what is wrong. And that's what you're talking about. Do you stay and challenge? Do you whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I may give a few points on the. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Excellent. So, on the initial question you asked, is a new denomination in North America necessary? Is a new Anglican denomination in North America necessary? I think we can answer that question by asking another. What is the present condition of North American Anglicanism? Well, I believe, and this is from my personal experience and just talking with others and researching the matter, um, modern can be described as a big tent. Your bandwidth uh, is low, and, Brian. Yeah, is it, it really, it's fitting. It's low that is very strange all right so let me make it brief then uh let me try turning off the camera maybe that will help okay so um every existing denomination is a big tent today it incorporates modernist anglo-catholic and charismatic elements the beauty of the church of england tradition is that it was confessional and its confession was simple enough to where we could require total uh, subscription without exceptions. Like most Presbyterian denominations allow ministers to take exceptions to portions of the confession, as long as it doesn't add up to a certain amount or it's not a major subjects. But the Church of England has always required total conformity to its confessional standards. That's one of the things that makes our tradition unique. That is not being done today in North American Anglicanism. Secondly, North American Anglicanism is ecumenicalist. It's ecumenist. Um, there was that Facebook post just a few days ago highlighting uh, Ray Sutton's position as ecumenical officer for the REC ACNA, and they're engaging in that um, ultimately, at best, pointless, at worst, uh, destructive dialogue with error. And it's a part of this broader ecumenical movement, the merging of churches that we see throughout. Which included um, the Greek Orthodox the and Roman Catholic. Exactly. Then the third point, so they're engaged in Big Tent Anglicanism, they're engaged in ecumenicalism, and they are engaged in, at least in many cases, uh, they're becoming increasingly woke, adopting sort of a cancel culture mentality. Um, 
So I think the big question when we consider is a new denomination necessary? Is reformed Episcopalianism worth preserving? A genuine reformed Episcopalianism that our forefathers would have recognized a century and a half ago. Um, is it worth preserving? If it isn't, then we should all just go somewhere else and start doing something else. But if it is, we need to find a solution because the present denominations aren't cutting it. Well, Ryan, I agree. I think the Reformed Episcopal Church is worth saving. And I'm sorry that it went the direction that it went. Um, there are, I suggested the idea of unaffiliated churches, start them out as unaffiliated churches. But I also think the easiest church to take over, and I'm not using the, this, this key clean up Arcani method of the of, of Clement of Alexandria or the Oxford movement, but rather uh, go in there and basically just take it over. In other words, they'll set just about any church they can get, but take it over and make it uh, reform, make it confessional, make it what it should be. It's small enough that it can be done. Well, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't even gone there. I don't know how you do that, but it's an interesting concept. All you have to do is have a majority. Well, you know, I'll, they'll never let me in. That's, huh? They'll never let me in. By the way, I had a wonderful chat with the president of Reformed Episcopal Seminary when I was up in Philadelphia and Princeton. And he too, like Bishop Gullet, Gillen, was just, it was weirdly over sugary now i don't know if that's i misperceived that or what i said well i'm an rec man in exile and he goes oh no you're not we dortrechtians have to stick together and i you know where in the world did that come from anyways it's an interesting idea because they got about six seven thousand people still very small maybe a hundred churches but you'd face heavy headwinds from Sutton. Well, I'm not talking about the REC. I'm talking about the UECNA. Oh, my boss, my boss. I thought you're talking about the REC. Much, 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 much smaller. And besides that, uh, Aaron's church had half the uh, congregations, had half the number of uh, members in one church. Yeah, but the bishop is half Lutheran. Uh, he, 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 he shifts from one place to another. Uh, I know. When I first met him, he was insisting that Anglicanism was between Geneva and Zurich. And now he's got it from Zurich to uh, Wittenberg because he wants to cut Geneva out. That's the reason. That's the reason I like to throw the Westminster Confession in and point out that it was an Anglican document. Church yeah. Of Anglican well, document. You all know me. I'm a Westminster man. Um, there may be a few places you want to take an exception or two, and this is in relationship to Ryan's remark that if you have the Westminster standards, and I would love to see an upgrade if we had a new denomination, and that's still being discussed. I like to see it, including the RES. One of the titles might be R.E.C. Continuing. I don't know. Kind of like the Church of England continuing or the Free Church of Scotland continuing. Now, I don't, that's just, a, I'm throwing it out there, but, you know, if we adopted the Lambeth Articles of 1595, the Irish Articles of 1615, Canons of Dort, Westminster Confession, you know, you talk about running the termites out of the wood, termite uh, fix. I mean, well, they, they, haven't, come they, around they haven't saved the Presbyterians. Yeah, they have. Not really, only certain parts of it. Well, yeah. The, I mean, the that, that's the problem. There are too many moles in the church. There's too much. There's too five. Many moles in sheep's clothing and tares in the wheat field. There's 500 to 600,000 reformed churchmen in the u.s yes the liberals split off yes they're dying but there are still reformed confessional people in this country and that kept the confession and, and moved along okay i'll stop talking others want to talk donald 
Donald. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ryan. It's just low. Okay. Yes. Uh, Joe, I do have one quick follow-up question. You mentioned the UEC. Given our agreement in confessional Anglicanism being based in the historic prayer book, how is the UEC's membership in the continuum and its adoption of the 1928 prayer book? How does that affect your vision of that becoming a reformed Anglican denomination? Exactly. Well, it was prayers for the dead people and there Holy are, Communion. There are people in the church and probably majority of the congregants uh, reject the 28 Book of Common Prayer and only want the 1662. And you're seeing more and more of that coming up in the UEC. Uh, but the REC fixed that book. It, not, and it needs some amendment too, but FC, old FCE, old REC fixed the baptismal office, fixed the declaration of remission of sins, and from my standpoint, could throw out the, the ordination service for bishops. I don't like well, bishops, Joe. I just don't. Well, well, maybe Usher should be studied a little bit more on the uh, on the Reformed uh, Episcopacy. Uh, and maybe in the future, Aaron Long, who's with UECNA, could talk to us about the Hungarian or Usherian model of Episcopacy, which is a reduced Episcopacy where the bishop really can't do anything unless the elders and laity allow. I mean, we've had with Riches and Sutton, the Theonomist, we've had monarchialists, and that was a big change in the 90s. You and I lived through that, Joe. Well, I think Riches was a tractarian from the beginning, and he just disguised himself until he got into power, and then he pushed the idea that that everything but episcopacy is undesirable and the smallest unit of an episcopal church was the diocese under the bishop yeah you know that was not uec uh, theology and just because the declaration of principles says episcopacy is desirable doesn't mean everything else is undesirable yeah so that certainly I'm wasn't the history of the rec but if you tell the truth with an econ economical standard, you only tell the truth to your advantage. Dishonesty. Yeah, that was. And we could um, talk about that because I've studied that to some degree. And those who want to follow that, the history of the Reformed Episcopal Church can go to my YouTube site, Donald Philip Veach, and look up Reformed Episcopal Seminary. And there's seven videos that outline the Reformed and Calvinistic uh, history of the REC. Now, I understand ACNA and REC bishops all know of those videos and have watched them. And if you're associated with me, you know, be careful. Watch your back. Donald, I'm the bad guy. I'm the enemy. Donald, can I, can I come in from an England? Yes, please. Yeah, great. So I'm I'm actually um, uh, uh, on the the general synod uh, uh, for the Church of England, and um, it's fair to say that the national church is collapsing, it's imploding um, on a number of levels. And so what I'm really interested in is what comes next, um, especially for those authentic Anglicans that are still in the church, because much of what the Church of England does is an Anglican, um, but there is still a remnant of faithful uh, uh, prayer book Anglicans in the church. So what comes next? And how how might we? I mean, from everything everybody said, I think it's drawing a line under what's come before, and and trying to start something new. Um, I'm quite interested in, but but the they are they are tractarians. It's the wrong theology. But this this the Anglican unions model, um, which seems to allow the the, the sort of planting of uh, of of um I, I can't remember what they call them whether they call them oratories or something like that. Um, I'm just very interested in in what could come. Now, it might be what you guys are thinking about is more focused on America, um, but England's in crisis at the moment. And, you know, unless we do something uh, that the, the traditional um, prayer book Anglicanism faces a, a, an uncertain future. 
Um, I'll let others jump in on that. That's a great question. You know, and Joe, you kind of commented on stay where you're at and affect what you can around you. Um, as far as this particular meeting, you know, this is great that we're together and thinking together. You've got eight, we've had 18 people here. We're now down to 17. Better to have 17 brains than one brain, so to speak. Well, and, I and was new CNA and uh, I got asked to leave. Okay, and the reason I got asked to leave is because I made complaints about certain things in UECNA. I told the person that told asked me to leave that they were not following the Constitution and canons of the church. I was, even the stuff I didn't like. Bill, I, I, I'm, can I make a, just some suggestions as to uh, how to begin uh, this series of discussions that we're going to have? Um the 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 problem the, the main problem that I see in the United States at any rate is uh, that uh, it is recognizing three streams. Yes, uh, we need to begin by saying that we do not recognize three streams. We recognize only one stream. Uh, as far as ecumenicalism goes, we should describe that we should say that we are are definitely uh, uh ecumenically oriented but only with respect to the reformed traditions only with respect to reformed denominations we are not ecumenical with respect to orthodox or with respect to catholic or to uh or with respect to baptists or to, but only with respect to the reformed traditions and would you and those, include the Lutherans those lines there too? Be, what? Would you include the Lutherans there too? No, I do not include the Lutherans. Only, only Reformed. Nor do and I. With, with respect to this, we should be saying, with respect to what confessions we, 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 we recognize, yes, we are based in the 39 articles, but we will use any of those other Reformed confessions which you have mentioned as an interpretation or as an enlargement or as a, a redefinition of what the 39 articles mean. In other words, we're going to take those other, those we're going to, we're going to recognize our affinity and our allegiance to those other, to those other confessions as well, without denying the 39 articles. And, uh, and then, ahead, and, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then uh, uh, I, I would say that that how we start. There was somebody mentioned how we start. Um, well, some of us are 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 have uh, have uh, uh, clerical ordination uh, papers that and they may may already have churches that they are running. Some of us are are not are not clerics. Um, uh, I I think that the that the members of this of this organization at this early point in time should include people who are running uh, 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 prayer book reformed home groups and prayer groups. Um, yes, uh, these should ultimately turn into churches, but uh, at this early early stage, they really need to include everybody who is of the of the same mindset and finally uh the fifth point that i have is uh here's a suggestion for what the name of this ultimate church should be called and i am recommending that we form a new denomination i do not see that there's any possibility of of starting this off within one of the existing denominations anywhere in the world so i here's just a suggestion english reformed church skipping the skipping the term anglican because it's too messed up with all kinds of all kinds of nonsense we are we are english based and we are reform based and we need to we need to establish our identity our our uh, our brotherhood with other reformed churches Anyway, those are my my points. So what would you do about the uh, churches that are in Brazil that are part of the Free Church of England, Ecumenical Confession, 
uh, in Chile and even here in the United States. Uh, I, th I think that English becomes kind of a problem. Well, certainly, Joe, on that point, uh, establish fraternal connections to them that we're, we're like with Graham. I'm as close to Graham as I am to you as an old rec -er and to my beloved brother, Jeff Hubbler. Glad he's here. Uh, but I, I do hear you, Joe, on that. When you use the word English, you know, are you excluding the great brothers in South America? Uh, they don't seem to mind using Roman as a, I mean, that's, those countries very readily have plenty of churches with the Roman name in their church name. So I, I don't know if that's a, as quite of a huge sticking point. Um, that, but that's, that's my uh, unordained opinion. I, I know Jeff Hubbler's denomination, small though it be, is called Reformed Anglican Church. But I, with Hudson, uh, when as soon as you mention the word Anglican, you, you know, the whole a whole bunch of other baggage is on view. So I think Hudson's point is tries to commendably state <laughs> our connection and affiliation with the Reformed churches, Presbyterian, Reformed, Dutch, French, Gallic, uh, the Gallican, the Southern German Reform, the Dutch Reform, the Scotch Reform, the English Reform. Now, how about Celtic? Because, uh, I mean, there's no question the Reformed Church of England, those words are used variously in the Elizabethan period, and they were recognized as Reformed. And I had a wonderful discussion with Dr. Tweeddale at Ligonier. We were talking about creeds and confessions, and I said, King James sent five delegates to the, to the Synod of Dort. They all signed it. One of them was the notary. His name slips me now, but he was a five-pointer. And James subscribed to it. And I said to Dr. Tweed, well, why didn't the Church of England codify the canons of Dort alongside the 39 articles? Dr. Tweeddale said, oh, that was political. James <laughs> wanted to throw a sop, throw an olive branch to the Dutch Reformed elders and the Continental Elders, but on the other hand, King James didn't want to elevate elders who might overcome the episcopacy, because for James, no bishop, no king, no king, no bishop. So I, I said, well, what would have happened if the Church of England adopted the canons of Dort? And he goes, it would have been totally different. So, I mean, the canons of Dort have got to be in there. And this is from my standpoint as an old rec -er. The time has come for an upgrade, confessionally. Yesterday, I got a notice from Norton saying, uninstall your old 360 Microsoft and we'll install the new Microsoft. Well, this is 2023 and these, these uh, like ACNA, they think there is a big deal because they give lip service to the 39 articles. Well, where's the maturity? Where's the experience? Where's the confession of unity with the Continental Brethren of the Unified Reformed Church? Anyways, other voices want to talk. And back to Luke Appleton, I don't know the answer, but it's, it's pending, Luke. I agree with what Joe said earlier that, uh, let me turn off the camera so you can't hear me, right? Uh, I agree with what Joe said earlier that, um, Basically, we need to think local and act local in terms of church planting, in terms of any form of denominational structure. Uh, perhaps one error in a lot of these groups is that they try to take a the laws and the model of a national church extending thousands and thousands of miles and covering tens of thousands of people, and they try to bring that structure wholesale and put it into a small denomination of maybe 500 or 2,000. Or 3,000. The result is you give far too much power to few, to relatively few people, and there aren't enough checks and balances. So I think that if any denomination is to be established, it needs to be localized. Not even just within the United States, but even having perhaps each state as its own province. 
That way the clergy and the people uh, who are in that state can focus on their local work. You don't get distracted by the big national picture. Um, there would be a fraternal union between the various groups, but without this top-down um, bureaucracy that, if anything, proves more of an anchor than a blessing to, um, to ministry work. You're and, thinking, um, Ryan, you're, you're thinking of the UECNA with this super large canons and constitutions at far exceeds the limits of this little 500 to 1,000 group. Am I right in that? You are right, yes. And it allows certain individuals who, um, well, organizations like that generally are highly conducive to those who want power. And people who want power, let's say people of a more, people who want power in a small organization so that they can basically be a piranha in the goldfish bowl, a term that uh, I think is appropriate for a lot of these Anglican groups. I'm not saying the UECNA is like that in particular, but I'm just saying that's a danger with any of these groups that are small, but have a lot of power that's centralized. Then you got three, um, or, three or four of those guys who were bishops without a church, I'm told. So I think just in general, to... we have to think local and act local in terms of um, any future ministry work in America. But I think, again, the key question is, is the Reformed Episcopal tradition worth preserving? That question needs to be seriously contemplated and answered before any, um, any further developments are made. Um, and we might say, yes, it is worth preserving, but are we willing to actually put, you know, tires to the pavement to yeah. put our own, um, lives into it, to put our, um, you know, to, to actually invest in that tradition, um, and see that it's continued, not just for the next 50 years, but for the next 500 years on this continent. I was thinking 100 years. You have to think long term. With with an online seminary for associates, bachelors, master divinity and doctorate, like the TNARS program, but with Anglican a few Anglican classes thrown in there. So regarding that, Donald, would it perhaps would it be good to start off with an Anglican or not Anglican, I don't want to use that term, a reformed Episcopal studies program that might coincide with TNARS. So they take their main curriculum there, then they get an introduction to the prayer book, to the articles, to the reformed Episcopal tradition as like a certificate. That well, way we're not reinventing the wheel. I understand the point, but the name is awful. Log College and Log Seminary. Where'd you get your PhD? At the Log Seminary. What in tarnation is that? Rose by any name. I take your point uh, why reinvent the wheel. It is the best seminary curriculum in the nation, bar none. Heavy reading, heavy writing, um, but we need a name for that too. Now, Matthew Byers from London, Ontario was going to be here. I don't see him here this morning, but he says that would be easy for him to reduplicate. And he's... Uh, website genius and he also is very much interested in what we're doing so i'm a big advocate of log college and seminary and i was with them and i had a few students they dropped out ultimately but i could the old name was the reformed let's see the north american reformed theological seminary beautiful name widely you know could identify with that whether you were a reformed anglican or not but uh they had this romantic notion of william Tennant in the backwoods of pennsylvania with the first log college and so dr john mcdonald had a moment of romanticism and nostalgia and renamed the whole school you know the log college well that's just i i, I couldn't abide that I, I, for me, anyhow, 
Oh, there's and I and uh, Ryan, you're in Log Seminary, getting your finishing your PhD in church history. Anyways, brothers, so we got about three, four, five, six minutes. Uh, <coughs> and for anybody who wants to contribute, there's a little unmute button by your name if you want to talk. So you um, know. Oh no, sorry to uh, speak again, but. I, you, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning was around being whether we want to be a, an inward group of people that is an echo chamber or whether we want to be missional. Uh, and my view is that we need to be missional. Yep. Um, it, not many denominations now have been founded since the Internet age. So the whole model of denomination, and I mean, before the Internet, denomination had to be local. I'm not saying that the Internet can replace the local church. The local church is, and, and fellowship is obviously vital. But what I'm saying is that things are different now and it's how we can be as missional how can we uh, uh, reach as many people with the gospel and a spe specifically the truth of scripture which is what we believe in that's why we want to be a, a reformed church because it represents the truth of scripture and i think it, 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 we need to think about how we can be as missional um a, 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 as possible we don't just want to be a a, a, a inward facing sort of um a, a, a group of of of, you know, with the, with the echo chamber, like you said at the beginning. Well, I just saw Christian Bolano, or Bolano, I think I'm saying that right, Christian, suggested a blog or an internet newsletter or something to that effect that would be free and available worldwide. And I think if we're going to be uh, a reform body, Church of England, old RES, we also want to keep the international eye open, too you know, across the nations, the Abrahamic covenant. I would Let, like to uh, speak in support of the idea of taking advantage of the age in which we live and the connections that we make. It's nice to speak in terms of every state having its own uh, uh, diocese or whatever, but we may be talking about five, 10, 100 people scattered quite great distance. And, uh, why not make a strength of the way you can get together and have a prayer book, fellowship, a service, even week in and week out with a group of believers? They may not be near you. We have um, every Wednesday night a our prayer meeting. I have two people in attendance who have moved from Virginia to Portland, Oregon, but they still join us uh, by taking advantage of that. So I think the, the key is to build an organic fellowship. Uh, points of agreement and see how it develops, what kind of connections, whether denominational or perhaps just giving support and encouragement to people in a, a you know, in a parallel denomination or parallel work within their denomination. So I think an organic building through fellowship and making connections online really is a great way to do it. For those of you who don't know, that's the Reverend Dr. Jeff Hubler, my classmate, friend, and Jeff, I want to do a YouTube with you on your school in the future. And that's because I we I I would like this group to be heavily supportive of K through 12 education, a association of Christian classical schools like Ryan Underwood's in that as well. But uh, I mean, that's another discussion. Um, does anybody want to just kind of and great point, Jeff, and great seeing you, brother. Um, anybody want to try to summarize where we've been and bring this, um, bring all the loose ends together? One decision we'll have to make is two weeks too often to meet, or should it be once a month? I'm thinking every two weeks to just kind of steer the, get, get us going. But anybody? I think maybe you want to do two weeks just initially and then move to a month. Yeah. Anybody else? I, I would suggest that when you had these things, that you choose one subject to talk about. You, you threw out too much at one time. Well, I understand that. I understand that. And I just wanted to give you what had been passing through my, the small space between my ears. What should we focus on next time? Let's narrow it down. Well, um, some, sometime we ought to read Lightfoot on, um, it's on the part of his Galatians commentary 
on the Christian ministry. You all familiar with that? J.B. Lightfoot? Yeah. So he, he distinguishes why the Episcopacy is worth retaining, but not as a separate order and supports it biblically and historically. Yeah, well, that's the church government discussion that's waiting to, that's on the drawing board. I, I, I want elder equal bishop. And if we elect a moderator, he's only a senior presbyter. But he might be consecrated to the office, but it's not a separate order. Right. Yeah. Anyway, something like that, reading ahead and discussing would be great. Uh, even just a nice devotional piece if someone wants to introduce uh, the hour together um you know would would be fine too yeah and i would like to see featured speakers like jeff here to come in for 10 15 minutes and describe the wonderful stuff he's done with the hundreds hundreds of children and something to go to i went to jeff's school one time a couple times actually one time i go in he's leading morning prayer and there's all these 10 12 whatever young people doing the prayer book without without opening the book it was truly amazing it was beautiful to watch you know i wonder if i might just jump, jump in here my name is nigel i don't not familiar with any any one of you here i'm actually coming from the great white north up here in canada and uh i'm an observer obviously i'm coming I'm from a reformed um and presbyterian background i'm a member of a reformed uh, uh dutch church up here but uh, I am excited to, um, to learn a little bit more about what you're attempting to achieve here. I'm uh, very sympathetic to the plight of Anglicanism, not just in, uh, in the U.S., but, uh, but around the world. And uh, I do see a great need for a reformed version of, uh, of Anglicanism. So I'm um, very uh, uh, excited um, uh, to learn about what you're trying trying to achieve here. And I, I know we, as an observer, I've noticed that we've covered a lot of ground here today, um, or this morning, I should say. Uh, we talked about um, dif different confessional standards, whether we should be part of a new, whether we should be a new denomination or, or attempt to reform an existing den denomination. I think for the next meeting, I think uh, the agenda does need to be shortened a little bit and maybe a little bit more focused. Uh, no, we talked about uh, uh, education, seminary, uh, confessional standards, uh, the role of the, the bishop. I think we do have to narrow down those those items before we um, before we see a, see a, a clear path forward. I think fundamental to the question of moving forward would be um, the question of the role of the bishop. I mean, uh, historically. Uh, Anglicanism has seen a threefold or three orders of uh, of bishop and um, and uh, presbyter and and, uh, and 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 deacon. Um, I think that's a fundamental question going forward, and I think that really um, drills down some of these. I'll shake out some of these other theological issues. Um, if we if we reduce or or erase the the office of bishop. Um, then essentially you were more of a Presbyterian, uh, more of a Presbyterian body than, than a, an Anglican body, it seems to me. Um, I think you'd have to go back, uh, I think as you said, Hudson, back to uh, a modified Episcopacy that, that James Usher uh, yes. was promoting back in 1641. But uh, really all to say is I think going forward or for the next meeting, I think we need to be maybe a little bit more focused on uh, on, on the agenda and maybe pick one or two items that we, that we hope to hope to cover and get some resolution on. I think it's, too, a, a, little, it's a little bit premature, it seems to me, to be talking about uh, a name because I think some of these other theological issues really have to be, be addressed and, sh and, uh, and shaken out before we can even identify a, a, or a, a, a name going forward. Nigel, you've summarized it well. It agrees with Joe that we need to narrow it. I'm also was born Canadian, so I hear your Canadian accent. Uh, Mom and dad are graduates of University of Toronto. Okay. Uh, we go back to 1808 in Canada, up near Uxbridge and Allison, Ontario. Anyways, Nigel, it's a nice summary. Here's what I would propose for a vote in this presbytery. Um. 
should we confine ourselves to just episcopacy, James Usher, and government, and maybe just keep it there, realizing that we got big questions before us? And number two, can we vote today on whether two weeks from now is a good way to go? Somebody want to count, speak up and vote how you want to do it. So that is narrow it down. And I would suggest that we have the Reverend Dr. Jeff Hubler give us the views of J.B. Lightfoot and Galatians, elders, bishops, and then uh, we can go from there. And, and then two, do we want to meet in two weeks and start, start sorting out these huge pieces we got before us? And the design was put it all out there where we could go. And yeah, what I will do when I put YouTube, I'll call it the Reform, United Reform Synod until we change or get a name, whatever, up the road. Anybody, any thoughts, any votes? Um, Donald, just a quick yes. practical question. Um, in, in the meantime, whatever we end up voting now, are we planning to have either a dedicated chat for this group in on Messenger or even a, an email mailing list, whichever one you, whatever people think is better, but just so that all the conversation can, can stay in one place, if you see what I mean. Good point. Uh, we need an email list. I don't know where we record that. Um, other thoughts? Good point, Luke. I agree with that. Perhaps create a, a perhaps create a uh, private Facebook group where we can post announcements, updates, um, relevant information. Are Are we okay tentatively to say no to Facebook? Pardon? No to Facebook. Oh. Where would we ha be able to chat then? I'd put it on Gab. I don't know if they do well, private groups. Yeah, though. Gab well, is I'm on Gab. Gab. Uh, instead of yeah, I'm, Gab Gab. Well. I'm not on Facebook. Like the big tech. Yeah, Gab or Telegram are both fairly good platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, What's the problem with Facebook? Oh, come on. Security. Zuckerberg. Yeah, well, that's funny. Yes. You name it. Oh. It, okay. Technologically, it's useful. Politically, it's, it's reprobate. And they can they, they can cancel you at any moment. What's wrong with an email list? That's, I'm fine with that too. Yeah, we could go there. Chat, that... chat during Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. I get that. Okay, I don't know how to get an email list together. Maybe somebody is smarter. Oh, did, you, did you contact everyone? Just send a, a circular one. Well. Uh, this was put on via Facebook advertisement, and then I contacted you by email. Does I'll tell you what. Email, we can all send you our email. You should have them all. I have yours, and I have Ryan's. I may have Joe Mailer's and Graham's. Uh, Tonight, when, when, when I registered for this Zoom meeting, uh, I had to provide my email address so uh, i presume that everybody else did as well yes it's got to be mm -hmm. somewhere. it's somewhere um what what you can do is we could use and if you don't like facebook you might not like this idea but you there is something called um a, a google mailing list and it just means that if anyone replies it goes to i mean you could just do reply alls i guess but um that's also an option i think it's free yes why don't um can, I establish a private Facebook group called United Reform Senate, private, just, and invite just you folks. Give me your email, and I can reconstruct a, a Google uh, email chain to be amongst ourselves. Anybody agree? That's fine. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. And how about we confine ourselves to just episcopacy that amongst the many issues and have Jeff Hubler. Jeff, would you be willing to give us a brief on that? I'd be happy to, yeah. And I want all you people to know that this guy, Jeff, is super special to this old guy. Um, I've known him longer than anybody in here, I think. We're classmates of Reformed Episcopal Seminary. Jeff was RES until he wasn't. He was very successful. Well, they weren't. 
until they, <laughs> and he was successful in reviving and bringing back to life the old Christ Memorial Church. And the bottom line is that Jeff was a taller blade of grass than a certain uh, man in purple. And then there was an envy factor and Jeff ended up leaving and going to Appomattox, Virginia to be successful as an educator. But Jeff, if you'll do that, um, give us 10, 15 minutes and maybe that should dominate the whole hour maybe without decisions. I think let's just talk about government. I'm a two order man. Others, you know, how do how does that work with Usher and the Hungarian uh, Reformed Church, which had bishops? And is two uh, so we've is everybody okay with that? Let's vote by the Presbytery here. Any objections? No. No. Uh, anybody with thumbs up? No. Oh. Okay, that's the easy way to vote. Um, now, is two weeks good? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Is that the last weekend of February? Yeah, can we do that, Jeff? It's fine with me. Okay. Well, let's bring this meeting to a close, and I have asked Reverend Ryan Underwood, by the way, for all of you, he's a young genius. He won't tell you that, but I will. Age 20, a bachelor's age 23, a master divinity, age 25, he's finishing his PhD through Log Seminary, um, a tough school. Anyways, we love Ryan. He's young, us older guys, me, I'm 70. Hudson, Joe, we're in the same camp. We got to take care of these young guys like Luke and Cody and Matthew Byers and Ryan Underwood and love them and be older mentors and to help and Christian Bologna and Christian Bologna. Yes. Is it a rolled L Christian Bologna? The N -A on the, on the end makes it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Correct. Bologna. Oh. Thank you. And thanks for, for calling me young. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm an old guy. And we're here for you. So uh, let's close this with Ryan uh, leading, closing us in prayer. Brother Ryan. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications before thee. Grant in this way we may have the knowledge of thy truth, the unity of thy Holy Spirit and the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. 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 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Good to be with all of you guys. Superb. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Jeff, good Amen. to see you too, brother. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm good to see you, Matthew. This is yeah, going to be on. You, this is going to be on YouTube, by the way, for those who couldn't make it. So I'll say goodbye. Goodbye, y'all. Good Lord's Day tomorrow. Goodbye, everyone. Lord bless tomorrow. Bye, all. Bye.